Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the LA 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the one of the stars of the 1982 classic musical Annie, Roseanne Sorrentino. You all know her as that feisty mean girl at the orphanage, Pepper. I'm having her on the show today to talk about the making of that classic movie. Uh, she actually got to play Annie um, on a national tour before that. And now uh, she's doing stand-up comedy. And I want to ask her about all of that, obviously, because you all know I do comedy. And I can't wait. It's going to be pretty cool. It's going to be a pretty interesting show, I think. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Roseanne Sorrentino. Hello. Hey, Roseanne. It's Tommy. Oh, hi. How are you? I am great. How are you? I am well, thank you. Well, this is such an honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, absolutely. No problem. My pleasure. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, going back in time, uh, you were a child <clears throat> actress, of course. Yes. At what age did your love of acting start? Uh, I guess it really started at the age of nine when um, my daughter, who was also my babysitter, mm -hmm. was attending the um, American Academy of Dramatic Arts in the city, and they needed some young girls for the prime of Miss Jean Brody, and she asked my mom if I could go into the city with her and do it. And I think that's really when I realized this is what I love to do. Mm -hmm. You're doing uh, school plays and community theater and all that? I had not done any of that. This was the first thing, and then um, shortly, you know, I was always a performer uh, in the neighborhood. I would, you know, you told me to sing, I'd sing. If you told me to dance, I'd dance. I was like a little trained, you know, circus act. But um, then shortly after the, the uh, Prime Minister Jean Brody is when I auditioned for Annie. Mm -hmm. So that's really how it all started. Wow. And you had no prior singing and dancing training before that play? No. Wow. No. That nope. is... Just singing always came naturally, and, you know, I took your basic schoolgirl dance lessons, but nothing, you know, earth-shattering. Wow, that's amazing. And that's also a big leap, too, at eight years old, to, to go into um, uh, American Academy of Dramatic Arts, uh, you know, thing like that. Wow. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. I was going on the train with my with my neighbor, and I, who, who, as a matter of fact, um, she is married to John Landau now, and they have their oh. acting company together. Oh wow! So, yeah, and your so uh, it was a good time. And your your parents were actors too. No, they were not. Um, my father did play the drums, but he wasn't a full time musician or anything. But um, no, they just, they always encouraged my singing and, you know, performing, but mm -hmm. they were not performers themselves. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Wait, so, yeah, when you were, tw so you were about, what, 12 when you did Annie on the national tour? No, I was uh, 11. 11. When I did that, and then I was, um, like, 10 going into 11, and then when I was 12 is when I... Uh, made the film. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of places did you go to on that tour? We went all over the United States, and we hit to, actually went to Vancouver, Ottawa, um, I think Montreal, but I don't really remember. <laughs> but then we did 48 cities in the United States. Wow. Over a year and a half. Wow, that's phenomenal. <laughs> it, was, it was very cool. We, we stayed in a lot of different places. I saw a lot of things. I met a lot of people. So it was definitely um, an amazing experience for everybody involved, not just me. I mean, my mom traveled to places that she probably never would have gone to otherwise. So it was really very cool. Were, were you legally, legally required to, uh, to have tutoring? Yes, we had a tutor who traveled with us. Mm -hmm. So we, we had school, I don't know, we had like three hours a day of school, and uh, the tutor traveled, 
what a great gig that had to be, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and so being a teacher, you know, I'm, a, I'm an educator now. And um, I used to think, wow, it would be cool to, like, if I didn't have kids and stuff like that, it would be cool to get that kind of a job and just travel all over the country tutoring kids, you know? Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so we had the, the tutoring that we, we had to do every day. And um, and that was it. And then, you know, we did the show. Was was it was there any um, uh, then unknown famous actors in the play with you? Um, I don't think so. The most well known person in the show was probably Harv Fresnel, who has since um, passed away. But he did um, earlier movies in in like the sixties. With uh, he did Paint Your Wagon. And he did movies. He was very close with, with uh, Debbie Reynolds. And mm -hmm. um, so he was probably the most well-known name out of that. Did you say uh, Harv Presnell? Yeah. Yeah, he, he was in The Glory Guys. Mm -hmm. And then he had some work later on before, you know, and he was older after the, after the, uh, the play. You know, he was on Grace Under Fire, I remember. He did a few guest spots on TV shows, so... You know, he had a pretty good career. Yeah, uh, yeah, he played a crusty curmudgeon on Dawson's Creek, I remember. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. Yes, he did. That's right. Yeah, he was, a so, pretty, he was a pretty good actor. He was. He was, and he had an amazing voice. I mean, he just, he was the perfect Daddy Warbucks. Mm-hmm. I bet you did a pretty good version of Annie. Um, I like to, to think I, I did the role justice. I mean, Andrea McCarter was my, my idol when I was that age, and I wanted to be, you know, just like her and sing like her. So, you know, I, I think I did the, the role justice. Um, mm -hmm. So that makes me feel good. She, she wants, um, I saw her perform in the city, actually, and I saw her after the show, and, and we were chatting, and she was selling a, a record the money was going to charity and um you know she wrote on the record to my girls i love your mom and then she announced to the the group of people that were out there she was like she was one of the best annies so like you know that was really meant a lot coming from andrew mccardle wow and, and who played pepper in that in the play with me yeah um a girl named patty gilbert she played pepper and um uh, you know and I still buy a Facebook, thank God for Facebook, uh, I'm able to keep in touch with these people. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to see what they're up to and who's got kids. And we, we had a couple of years ago, they had the, um, it was the 40th anniversary of Annie opening on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So we had the um, Inside Edition get a whole piece on us. And we all met in the city. And then a bunch of us went out to dinner afterwards. And it was really, it was super to kind of reconnect with everybody and see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always nice. Yeah. So with the movie of Annie, um, were, mm -hmm. you, were you originally considered to play Annie in the movie? Uh, way back in the very beginning, the people who were casting it were interested in having me play Annie. But, um, you know, as, as time went on, I, I got taller. I, I sort of outgrew the role. Mm -hmm. So then the next thing was to audition for, you know, one of the orphans. And being that Pepper was the biggest one and the oldest one, you know, mm -hmm. that's the one that I auditioned for. And it wound up really being, I mean, sure, who wouldn't want to be the star of the movie, but it really wound up being a great role. And people will always tell me, you and Molly were our favorite orphans. And I hear that a lot. Yeah. So it was the two... I think the two orphans that stood out the most. So it was, it was a great time. It was a great. It was great fun making that. Mm -hmm. it, uh, at least you didn't get jealous of, of, of Eileen Quinn. You know, you were happy to play the role of Pepper. Oh, absolutely. Listen, you know, um, like I said, would, who wouldn't want to be the star in the movie? But I got, a, I had a great part and a great role, and I was still in it and still a part of it. And to this day, you know, kids really get excited to hear about it or, or when they meet me and they're like, oh my gosh, you were Pepper. And, you know, so it's still such a very cool thing in my life. How could I be anything but grateful for all of the experience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
I love it when Pepper interrupts Annie and Molly's tender moment. She gets out of bed and steps on everyone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and when I stepped on the, the one girl's head, mm-hmm. her scene was actually an accident. Yeah. And um, they loved it. And they were like, okay, keep that in, do it again. So I had to step on the poor girl's head <laughs> like <laughs> three or four more times after that. But, um, yeah, I got to, to be this totally different character, which was really a lot of fun for me. I feel sorry for those girls getting stepped on, though, because Pepper probably had stinky feet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, probably. (laughs) How how many months of uh, rehearsal and preparation did you all go through? Uh, For the film? Yeah. We, well, we filmed over the summer, and so we didn't really have a ton of prep. You kind of learned a number and filmed it, learned a number and filmed it, filmed different scenes. So you would rehearse maybe a couple of days and then film it the next day. Um, so we, we, I really only worked a, a total of, I would say, four months for my, for my part in the mm-hmm. filming. Yeah. Yeah. It was very different from the show where we rehearsed all summer. Like, I, I think we rehearsed from, from May to, to, September, mm-hmm. and then every day, all day, and then we opened in Dallas, Texas, in 1979. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with the mo- with the movie though, it's 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 like rehearsing a play that's going to go on for like six months. Yeah, it, it was just quick. You you learn the dance, you film it the next. You know, you do a couple of days, three four days of rehearsal, and then you film it, and then you never do it again. You know, mm-hmm. so. With a play, you have to get it perfect because you're doing it every night. I, I used to do stage crew for musicals, and it was a lot of fun, but I just the, I got so tired of hearing the same old songs over and over again. <laughs> oh, really? No, see, yeah. that was my favorite part. I love because it was different every night, even, even though it was the same stuff. You know, the audience is different. The energy is different. Um, you know, people say lines differently sometimes, you know, so it was always a little different, um, at least for me, that's, that's how I felt about it. Mm-hmm. How was John Houston on the movie? Uh, you know, he was very nice. He was a very nice man. He was quiet. He, um, kind of no nonsense, mm-hmm. but, um, you didn't really have a ton of interaction with him mm-hmm. unless he specifically wanted to give you a directive, but he was a very nice man. Yeah, the other people I've talked to that worked with him say they loved working with him, and that guy, he had such an amazing career going back to, to Bogart and Bacall. I mean, it's just oh. incredible. I, I mean, just to be able to say that I, well, I auditioned for him, mm-hmm. and he knew I was coming from the stage, so he said to me, this is not the stage. So you, you need to, you know, kind of tone it down as far as how loud I'm saying and stuff. So he actually had me sit at the table with him at the audition, very close. And he made me sing um, the song Maybe very quietly because he wanted to make sure that I, you know, I wasn't just going to be this Broadway belter to hit the back of the house. He wanted to make sure that I could sing softly and quietly and stuff. So. So that was kind of cool. That was, you know, I was like almost nose to nose with him at that point. And so it was it was quite a, a big deal for me to be able to say that I worked with him. Yeah, not to mention the fact, too, he was he was pretty old by then. Yes. Yes, he was. Yeah. <laughs> he was. He was. I mean, he was surely he was an interesting choice of director. Yeah. For that type of a film. You know, mm-hmm. but um, but he did it. I think every musical uh, movie adaptation in general has had an unexpected director. You know, like uh, A Chorus Line had Richard Attenborough. Mm-hmm. And he, was yep. so, he was such a distinguished actor, you know. And, um, God, there were so, so, many, so many musicals out there that had unexpected directors that I can't even think of right now, you know. That's true. That's true. So it's, uh, but he did a good job, and it, 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 it's still out there. People are still watching it. Yes. <laughs> and I do believe, 
um, I actually can't remember the name of the company now, but they're re-releasing a bunch of movies from the 80s mm -hmm. over the summer for limited engagement runs. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll, have to look, I'll have to look that up, and I'll, I'll have to send it to you in, in, in Messenger, because mm -hmm. they're, like, Annie is going to be in my area in June, you know, when it's going to play at a couple of theaters actually kind of close to me. So that's, that's really kind of neat that they're bringing them back into theaters along with other 80s movies that were sort of like iconic or, you know, iconic cult classic type movies, so. Yeah, th those those uh, limited runs are really hot right now. I'm, I've seen several of them the last few years. You know, I love them. Yeah, because it's something yeah, you didn't think you'd ever get to see in the movies again, and then here it is. So it's, that's really uh, kind of neat. Mm -hmm. How about working with Albert Finney? Oh, he was really a great guy. He was a lot of fun. He was really good with all the kids. He spent time with us. He joked with us. He, you know, told little funny stories or, you know, and he was just very easygoing. Like, there weren't really any divas in this mm -hmm. film. I mean, you really can't be a diva. You're working with kids, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, he was great, but hands down, the best one was Carol Burnett. She, to work with her, mm -hmm. was just unbelievable. She was so good in all areas, and just, she was so nice and so personable. You know, she's she's as nice as you want her to be. Mm -hmm. like, you know, when you, you're going to meet a famous person, you're like, oh my God, I hope they're nice and sweet. And she was. She was. And she would spend time with us between takes and talk with the kids and hang out with us. And, uh, you know, she was just great like that. Yeah, I, I came very close to meeting her last year. Um, every year in San Francisco, uh, we have a comedy festival called Sketchfest, and they're they're having this one event. I think it was like the anniversary of her career or something like that. And I was going to go. They had a meet and greet and stuff, but then I couldn't go at last minute. I was kind of sad about that. But, oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. She was just out here at uh, one of our our theaters out here, and, and I wasn't able to get tickets. And I wanted to go, so I'll have to try to catch her again. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she'll remember you. Well, she's there. she's actually known for remembering people, mm -hmm. you know. So we'll see. Maybe I'll get the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's Tim? Great. Yeah. How's Tim Curry? Um, him and Bernadette Peters, we actually had probably the least amount of contact with mm -hmm. except for one or two scenes so you know they were kind of like came in did their stuff and then went about their business they were probably the only two who weren't really into hanging out with the kids which was fine i mean you know i'm older now i don't particularly want to hang out with kids yeah <laughs> <laughs> <So. laughs> i don't blame you <laughs> yeah so i mean i get it but but I really, I mean, they were very nice and everything, but, um, you know, we really didn't spend a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ed Herman played FDR yet again in the movie. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah. He was a great man, too, and I was a really fantastic guy, very nice. I spent actually a, a lot of time when we were filming in the mansion mm -hmm. in uh, New Jersey. I spent a lot of time talking to him while he was in the makeup chair. And um, I don't really remember what we discussed, but I guess whatever it was, it was very interesting because I, I did. It. I spent a lot of time talking to him, so he was a very, very nice, uh, kind man. Mm -hmm. And J Jeffrey Holder, he was a national treasure. Oh, yeah. He was, he was fun. He was, I knew from being a kid, you know, the 7-Up commercial, the Uncola. Yeah. So I would always ask him to do that, and he would always do that for me. He was... He was very, you know, he's sitting here thinking, like, oh, my goodness, all these people have, Ed Herman, Albert Finney, Jeffrey Holder, they've all passed away. Mm hmm So. I know, it's sad. Yeah. And Anne Ranking was very nice, too. We'll just round it all out, you know. It, she was uh, she was a very nice person, too. So, But like I said, I didn't have a lot of, most of my stuff was, was done, you know, 
with the other kids. Yeah. So I didn't really get to interact with the other uh, the other actors too much. Although I do still keep in touch with um, Roger Minami, who played the act. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I still keep in touch with him via Facebook, but still, you yeah. know. And um, and then really not the other. The only one I really keep in touch with is Tony Ann, who played Molly mm-hmm. of the Orphans. Yeah, I found out that Eileen, she has a, a rock band now. Oh, really? Yeah. Called the oh, Le- I didn't know that. Called the Leaping Lizards or something like that. I'm going to reach out to her before the month is over because she's going to be oh. she's going to be doing a signing in L.A. And so I'm trying to get everybody who's – I'm trying to get everybody that I can get who's going to be at that signing to come on and promote and stuff. So, oh, that's cool. Fingers crossed there. It? Yeah, it's called the Hollywood Show. Um, it's at the LAX airport, and they have it every three months throughout the year, where they have everybody oh. you could possibly imagine. They like have over forty people from different movies and TV shows. Like you'll go there, and on one side you'll see the cast of Lost in Space, and on another side you'll see the cast of Porky's. I mean, it's just very eclectic, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I haven't gone yet personally, but I'm going to at some point. It's on the list. Uh, yeah. When the movie came out, Eddie Murphy did a sketch on Saturday Night Live where he was James Brown as Annie. Oh, yeah. Did you see that? <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Of course. And, of course, you know, people would be, oh, did you see that? Did you see that? So, yeah, we, we saw it. And um, we're huge. Growing up, and, and still now, we're huge Saturday Night Live fans, you know. Yeah. I've been true. I've been, I mean, I've been watching it since, I, I don't even know how long we used to tape it, back when you had, you know, VHS tapes. Mm-hmm. We would sit around during dinner, and we would watch them and laugh, and so we're, we're big fans of that show. Uh, me too, yeah. And I was glad that he came back to host finally, just recently. Oh, yeah, that was good. Yeah. He did all of the, the fan favorites. I was disappointed, though, that he didn't put the makeup on uh, when he was Gumby. But other than that, it was great. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess when you're a megastar after a while, you don't have to do some things, right? That or just, you know, the, it, was, it, was, it was too time-consuming to put the makeup on because it's a lot faster paced now and there's more commercials, you know. Mm-hmm. And they do really short commercial breaks on there now, I've noticed, too, at the same time. Yeah. What, what, what did you think when Mike Myers did a rap version of Hard Knock Life in Austin Powers and Goldmember? You know, I don't really... I, I like the, the tried and true, mm-hmm. you know, the way it was. I think it's always neat that these songs kind of creep in to other pieces of art, whether it's a movie or a play or, or a sketch comedy. So mm-hmm. it's always kind of neat because... People think of me then, you know, the people that I know. So, oh, did you see on this show they did Hard Knock Life, or this show they played tomorrow, or, or they referenced Annie on this show. So, so it, it's, it kind of like keeps it keeps the memory going. So yeah. I think it's kind of cool in that respect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I loved it. I remember seeing it in the theater, and I thought it was just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing rap into it, Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the 1999 Disney TV remake? 1999. Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did yeah. see that. Kathy Bates is um, Miss Hannigan, and uh, Victor Garber was uh, Daddy Warbucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was yeah. great in Godspell. Yeah. I mean, it was it was good. It was more true to the play. Yeah. That's what the play was. The play took place at Christmas and stuff. So, so that was um, you know more more true to that, but. Um, no, and I know I did not see the most recent one that was made. Me neither. I, I won't. <laughs> yeah. I, you, you know, I, I have nothing against the fact that, you know, they used an all-black cast. You know, I thought I think that's great. But it's just, you know, it's just it, it's a classic. You can't remake it, you know, like that, you know, for the movies. That's, what, that's how I feel. Like, you know, we made it once. It's just let it be. Yeah. Classic. You're never going to make something as good as... It's like remaking Dirty Dancing. Why are you going to do that? Yeah. Never going to be as good as the first one. 
you know? So yeah. that's how, that's how I feel about that. Yeah. I just, I just uh, have no desire to see it. <laughs> yeah, no, me neither. And that's, that's okay because, you know, some people don't have never seen the, the original, so that's fine too. <laughs> they need I to see that, it. Yeah. <laughs> So I take it you're a musical buff? I do enjoy my musicals. Yes, I do. Um, don't get to see as many as I would like these days because they're so incredibly expensive now to go. Mm-hmm. But um, I did see Frozen, which uh, I've seen a few of the Disney ones. Frozen was really amazing. Mm-hmm. It was really, really good on Broadway. And uh, Wicked, which I loved. Mm-hmm. But I still like some of the old, like I love Chicago. Yeah. That's one of my favorite musicals. Um, you know, I like more of the classic kind of type of musical. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think I see Tootsie actually recently on Broadway. And oh. um, foreclosed. And it was, really, <laughs> it was really good, I have to say. Oh, I got Good see. job with it. I gotta see that rendition. I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it, they did a really good job with it. So that was that was good. Yeah. But um, you know, I still like would like to see Dear Evan Hansen, which I haven't seen, and I'd like to see Hamilton, which I haven't seen. So it's a, it's on the list of things that I want to see. Mm-hmm. I I auditioned for The Sound of Music when I was in high school, and I didn't get it because I can't sing or dance. Those oh are... well, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, sing a dance to be in a musical. Yeah, those are two skills I wish I had, and but I enjoyed doing stage crew though. And I got the the last time I did it uh, was for Anything Goes uh, back in 2014. Um, I it was it was the first time since high school that I had done one, and it was a lot of fun. It was a little more physically demanding and stuff, but oh yeah, it was fun. Well, it- Kind of fun, and, and I would love to do it more. But you know, right now I am I'm an administrator uh, in a middle school, mm-hmm. so I have a very busy life and uh, career with that. Mm-hmm. But my plan is when I retire. Well, I've also started stand up comedy, mm-hmm, which I'm going to ask you about because I'm a stand up yeah. comedian. Okay. But before, okay. but before that though, I was curious. Um, after um, Annie came out and everything, did you not have a, a desire to act in movies after that? Oh, no, I did. I had a desire to. Um, but, you know, back in, in 1982, 83, 84, it was very different in the Hollywood scene. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the just even auditioning and stuff. So it wasn't like today, if you did a movie like that, you would be, you know, catapulted probably into instant stardom, but it wasn't like that. And so it was very difficult and I was having, you know, going in and out of the city and auditioning. And I finally just kind of got to a point. I was too old to play very young and I was too young to play older. Mm -hmm. And I just got to the point where I said, you know what, I'm just going to go to school. (laughs) And I hadn't been in school for almost two years touring and making the film. So I said, I'm just going to go to school and kind of enjoy being a kid. And I would say for the most part, and I'm happy with that decision, Mm -hmm. um, but there is always a little part of me that says, hmm, I wonder what would have happened if I kept trying, you know? Could I have the level of success in Sarah Jessica Parker or, you know, would I just be a starving actor now, you know, just trying to get a job to pay the bills. So, you know, and I knew that there were things in my life that I definitely wanted and I wanted to get married and I wanted to have a family and that didn't always, that wouldn't always be something that, you know, maybe I could have had. So uh, it was a conscious choice, but I do sometimes wonder what would have happened if I was able to just keep trying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And, uh, and Hollywood is always constantly changing, you know. And I've I've found that out in the last few years that I've been trying to get mm-hmm. acting work and stuff like that. It's just always constantly changing, you know. Social media crap that I just I just think you know it's really it's really ruined things. <laughs> it is. It's, it's very difficult, but you know, 
it's also as difficult as it is. I think it's it got more now for more. Um, there are more opportunities, like for me now. I think there are probably more opportunities for me now than when I was younger. You know, if that's something that I think I want to pursue, which you know probably will be something that I pursue after I retire in three years. So. Yeah. And also, too, I mean, back then, though, there was so much more work in terms of, God, they, they were just throwing money left and right for movies and TV shows, you know, that, that mm -hmm. you know, many of them didn't last, you know, a lot of TV shows that didn't last and stuff. Now, you know, there's so much, you know, online streaming with, with, with TV shows, you know, and you never even hurt, you never even hear of them, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. weird, it's just a weird contained time for entertainment now it is but there, there's a lot of there are a lot of venues now you know with hulu and amazon and netflix and, right. and and youtube and you know i've been i've been doing um a little facebook live show from my my home mm -hmm. i don't know if you got to see it at all i haven't seen it no okay so i i, I shame on me <laughs> that's right no i recently had to have some uh neck surgery oh so I was confined, you know, to the house, and I couldn't really do much, and I am not very good at being bored. Um, <laughs> so I took to Facebook Live and just started talking, basically. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of turned into my mom came over one day, and we were, you know, joking around on, on Facebook Live, and it kind of turned into this little Facebook Live show called Brace Yourself, hence the neck brace. And um, I've actually had guests on now, and I have uh, <laughs> I have people calling me saying, "Hey, I want to I want to be on your your uh, brace yourself show." So, and so I've been uploading them then to YouTube to see if, if they can get any likes or whatever. But you know, it it really started out as something that I enjoy, and now every time I I log on live, within a few minutes, there are a lot of people watching. So. You know, and they're telling me that I'm funny and I'm entertaining them. So, you know, I'm 50 doing it. So people go, get off Facebook, stop doing Facebook Live. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to keep trying it. Yeah, I would. I mean, you got to do something, you know. Well, you know, I'm, I'm learning that the, the new, you got to put yourself out there. And I think now that I'm older and I've had kids, I'm much more confident in who I am and more confident in my talents and my abilities. And so I definitely think it's easier to put yourself out there if you're feeling confident about who you are and what you can do. Um, and putting yourself out there is, is the way that people notice you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things have really changed a lot in my life and um, I'm just sort of taking our old cliche, but, you know, carpe diem, trying to seize the day and just have fun and enjoy what I do. And if, if people enjoy it along the way and they make people laugh or, or smile or, you know, whatever it is, then, then that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, in a couple of weeks, it'll be five years since I, I had a car accident. Um, it was pretty bad. I was in a coma for 30 days. And oh, my gosh. Yeah, and after I got out of the hospital, I realized that life was too short. I, I got I got to um, pursue showbiz, and I was on stage every night about two months after I, I got out, and all the way until I left the Bay Area, came down here to Reading because it was a lot cheaper. My mother and I, we uh, lost our apartment. We lost everything um, a few years before that. And we were going through really hard times at the time. And mm. I started this podcast in my bedroom. And I've just I've interviewed people that I can't believe that I, I would I would ever I would ever get a chance to talk to. It's been amazing. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. See, and it's just just a little uh, perseverance and just kind of taking taking that chance, going out on a limb. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, that's what you have to do. If you're not willing to, you know, I'm being, I, I, I'm a mom to two daughters, mm -hmm. you know, in their 20s. And I'm trying to show 
them through my own actions as well as talk to about it. You know, you're young. Mm-hmm. Go for it now. Don't yeah. wait. What are you waiting for? Make your, you've got to make your life happen. Life isn't going to happen for you. You've got to make it happen. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do. And actually, it, it, the Facebook Live show <laughs> kind of annoys them. Mm-hmm. They place in our house. And so it's kind of, you know, upsetting the apple cart a little bit. But I said, no, I don't care. This is, this is what I'm doing. I, I want to give this a try. I want to give it a try. So tomorrow I have on a girl. She's coming on, actually, who I met because she's a huge Annie fan. Mm-hmm. And she started to do community theater and do some acting and singing. And I, she's a teacher. And so she's going to come on tomorrow. We're going to talk about all things Annie, mm-hmm. which, you know, I'm excited for. So, so it should be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I... I waited way too long. I'm 36 now, but I waited way too long. I was always expecting that, you know, you know, things would come to me, you know, I, I was always like, Oh, I'll go somewhere and get discovered somewhere, you know, yeah. and just That's very rare. Yeah. It's very rare, especially now, but like, yeah, just everything went from, uh, from bad to worse. you know, I was working in security, working in retail and doing all my other stuff on the side, and I just, I just wasn't happy, you know. And this accident, it was a, it was a blessing in disguise for me. Oh, well, that's good. If it, good it, it comes out of it, of mm-hmm. any tragedy, then, then that's the good part, you know, because you have to learn. And if that's what it took for you to say, this life that I'm carving out right now is not the life that I really want, and I want something different. Mm-hmm. And that was a good thing that happened. Mm-hmm. So. So how so how did stand up come into the equation for you? So I, stand up is something I've always loved. Mm-hmm. Always loved seeing comedians going to comedy clubs. Um, and I am I'm pretty funny, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think anyway. So so I always wanted to try stand up, and my oldest daughter. When she was in college, she got involved with improv. Mm-hmm. She was really very good at it. And so it's, it's not the same at all, but I said, you know, I did see her do a little stand-up also. So I said to her, this local comedy club out here by us, I said, is doing comedy college. Do you want to go? So she said, all right. So, well, actually, she said, how much is it? And I told her, and she goes, I can't afford it. And I said, I'll pay for it. And she said, yeah. okay. <laughs> as long as I was paying for it. But, so we started going once a week. We did it for eight weeks. And we learned a little bit about how you create an, an act and how you kind of tailor jokes and stuff. Right. And then the graduation was this these two comedy shows you did. And I had, of course, people in the audience. We all did. We all, all of our friends, all of the people who were in the class, all of our friends and family came. But, you know, I made people laugh who weren't my friends and family. Mm -hmm. And that was a very powerful moment for me because, like I said, I always thought I was funny. My friends thought I was funny. But was I really funny or was I just funny to the people who knew me? And, you know, you do stand-up so you know stand-up is telling a a story Mm -hmm. or several stories in a very short amount of time, and the goal was laughter. So if you're getting people to laugh at what you're saying, and it's almost, it's very addicting. And so I said to her when we were done with that, I said, listen, I, I want to keep doing this. You want to keep doing this? She goes, I want to keep doing it. So we've been doing um, comedy shows, you know, bringers, where you have to bring people. We've been hitting open mic nights. Our comedy teacher has actually invited us back a couple of times to do guest spots for his other uh, comedy class graduation shows. Mm-hmm. So we've been doing um, a lot of stuff, and, and uh, we're actually going to be in the city doing um, Greenwich Village Comedy Club in Manhattan on January 11th, the both of us. And so it's been kind of a, a great thing, and, and people come and see. And, and now the biggest challenge for me is, to, to continue to write 
write um, new jokes. Mm-hmm. That, that's the tough thing, <clears throat> you know? Yeah. I'm constantly trying to, to write these new jokes. And so what I'm finding for me, uh, I don't know if this is how everybody does it, but I'm sort of adding on to bits that I already have and finding that I'm having to take some other stuff out because I have this new stuff now. So that's been kind of a process for me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we're actually going to do a couple of open mic nights this week to go and test out our new stuff. So nice. it's been it's been a real fun journey, though, and mm-hmm. uh, I really enjoy it. And so um, that's that's what I've been doing with it. And I, it, I would love to have it some, be something that I can keep doing. You know, I've met a lot of really good comedians, and um, they've been very, very nice and helpful. And so I met producers who are, they produce these comedy shows. And I don't know how they do it, probably the same out in, in California as here, but I find the most difficult part is having to bring people. Mm-hmm. Because yes. as, good, as good as your friends are, they're kind of like, dude, how many times can I drop $20 on a ticket with a two-drink minimum? Do you do the same jokes over and over again? Yeah. <laughs> Which I get, you know? So I think that's the biggest challenge right now is to get over that pump of how do I get good enough and a, a, a good enough following to mm-hmm. not have to, to just get hired. Yeah. I, I started doing stand up in San Francisco in 2006 and I, from the, from the moment I started, everyone hated me because I, I'm not politically correct. I'm a one liner guy and San Francisco uh-huh is very artist oriented and they do what uh, what they call um, alternative stand-up comedy and I had no mentors or friends and occasionally an older comedian uh, would who absolutely loved me would uh, give me some unsolicited advice which I would never follow because I don't believe in, in, in taking unsolicited advice especially when they don't know you you know mm-hmm. but um, yeah, those those bringer shows. Oh my God, it's the worst thing that's happened to comedy. I, I talked to a comedian about it the other day about how you know it's just it's it's, it's impossible to bring you know uh, a ton of people out on a week on a weekday night to, to come see you do an amateur comedy show. You know, right? It is. It's very difficult. And and thank God I have a really wonderful friends who do make the trek, and I try to. Um, you know, bring at least, I, I never, very rarely will I get the full six, but, you know, I try to get at least three, and listen, that's three more people in the audience than you would have had, right? So, let me tell my jokes. Yeah. <laughs> let me tell my jokes. But it's, it's, everybody's been really kind and really, really good, and, you know, I think that if I wasn't funny, they'd probably be like, mm, yep, nope, six, you gotta bring six. But, you know, I, I, I do a good job. You know, I don't ever do anything in my life halfway. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to get up on a stage and tell you a joke, you're going to bet your bottom dollar, you're going to laugh, you know? Yeah. So, um, so it's, been, it's been a really fun, fun experience. I just, every time, I just can't wait to, to do it again. Yeah, that's how I felt that after the first time I did it. I just, I just had that that feeling of of ecstasy. There, it's like I just need to go do do it again. You know. Mhm. Absolutely. Where Where do you uh, usually go work out your stuff? Um, we have a couple of uh, local places around here. We're actually checking out a couple of new ones. You know, we've done. Um, a bar around here. It's a bringer because it's a little line between a bringer and an open mic now because now they're calling open mic. Um, but you, they want you to bring people, so it's not really an open mic. So we're mm-hmm. looking for real, true open mics, which we found a couple of them. Right. Uh, and they're usually just a local bar that does an open mic comedy night. And it's mostly comedians that go. So, so that's what we're going to do this week. Mm-hmm. And um, they're on Long Island where I live. You know, there are open mic nights in the city, but it's a bit of a of a haul for me to go into the city just for an open mic. But um, I save those for the for the shows. You know, when I 
tell my friends, listen, I'm going to be in the city. And I'll mm-hmm. tell my, my city friend, I'm going to be in the city doing a show. Get some tickets, you know, and so it's still working out. But um, I'm anxious to do the, the open mic this week because I really want to try some some stuff that I'm not ready to try on an actual performance. Mm-hmm. You because know, I don't know how it will do, so I really want to test out some new material and see how it goes. Mm-hmm. And they say if you can make other comedians laugh, then your stuff is funny. Yeah. It, that that was always a, a, a difficult thing for me and stuff. A lot of it was jealousy, though. There's so many jealous comedians in San Francisco, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, in, 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 it's very cutthroat. In, in any kind of entertainment, it's cutthroat, you know? Because, and it has to be, because you are a dime a dozen, mm-hmm. you know? You're going to be a diva? We'll fire you from the show, because there are 45 actresses right outside the store who were killed for this opportunity. Mm-hmm. So you have to, I think, be, be humble and and be fair, and but you have to be aggressive. Yeah. And you, you have to look out for number one. And that's, it's a very hard balance, because you can come off looking like a jerk. Yeah. And you have to be able to be aggressive without being um, uncaring, mm-hmm. you know? And you have to be humble, and that's the number one thing. You can't think you are better than everybody in the room, even if you are. Mm-hmm. Even if you are. Um, you can't think you're better than everybody in the room. Otherwise, that it, it, that's going to come through yeah. in you. And then once that comes through in any type of entertainment, you're done. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So, that's my... That's my Unless, unless, <laughs> unless money is being made, because I have seen a lot of arrogant people with, you know, a huge following money being made and they get everything and people talk behind their back and say, I, I cannot stand this guy. But if he wasn't making money, you know, he wouldn't be here. Oh, well, listen, I'm talking about starting out. Oh, you st- get to a certain level. Yeah. There, yes, there are going to be people like that. I personally vowed to myself. Now, even if I got to that level, mm-hmm. I would never be that person because those people are short-lived. Like, I went and saw a pretty well-known comedian in a, a club in the city. Mm-hmm. And he was really funny, and I wanted I went up to him after the show just to be like, hey, you're great, I'm, star- I'm starting out myself, you know. And he could not be less interested in anything I had to say. And that really turned me off to him because you're only doing comedy because people are coming to see you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, don't literally bite the hand that feeds you. Yeah. Because you have to remember you're only, you know, funny if people are coming to see you. You're only uh, going to be in this show if people are coming to see you. And if you're a jerk to people that you um, meet, People are going to remember that, yeah. and they're going to talk about it, and they're yeah. going to tell other people, and word's going to get out, and that's going to affect people. You know, maybe it's not going to be career-ending or anything, but I wouldn't want anybody walking around going, oh, yeah, Roseanne Sorrentino, she was funny, but well, she's a jerk. I wouldn't want that. That would be... She's really pepper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? No, that would be very upsetting to me to have that happen, so I would not want that at all, so I'm... Um, I try to be very cognizant of how how I am and how I treat people, you know, in every part of my life. I mean, I'm an educator, so I try to teach kids that every day. Right. You know? So um, I just try to keep that in mind, especially when you're performing. People want to come up to you. And, and you know, in my act, I do reference the fact that I was pepper in the movie Annie because I make a joke um, about something my mother said to me. And after the show, when people find that, they want to come and they want to take pictures and they want to talk to you and they want to tell you how much uh, they love the movie Annie. And if I'm standing there for 30 minutes after the show has ended because people want to take a picture with me or talk to me about it, then I'm standing there for 30 minutes after the show ends. That's just what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. These people care enough to want to take the time out to tell me how they feel, then 
I'm going to respect that and give them my time. Uh, and, and I, and I truly genuinely appreciate when people, um, tell me how much they enjoyed the movie or if they thought I was really funny mm-hmm. or can I take a picture with you? That, that really makes me happy. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of respect for former child actors who do stand up comedy because they're so self deprecating about their past. Like, um, Alison Arngrim from Little House on the Prairie. She does one woman shows. And, oh, really? Yeah, she's been doing it for many, many years now. Um, and she calls herself the Prairie Bitch. <laughs> 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 and she's really funny uh, when she does it, you know. It, it's really hard for actors to transition into doing stand up comedy, though, because it gets looked down upon. And it, it happened to me, certainly. I made no bones about the fact that I came. Uh, from theater, and they and there was people in the beginning telling me your your comedy sounds so well rehearsed, and that's n- that's not what uh, people are looking for in comedy. And I just shrugged it off and said, okay, well that's this is my style, you know. Maybe I'm a performance artist, right? You know, I think there's there's plenty of room for all different styles. You know, I'm more of the um, <clears throat> experiential type comedy to take my experiences, things that have happened to me, being a mom, um, being a daughter, and I take those experiences and I, I basically talk about them in, in a funny way. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm not I'm not like a Jerry Seinfeld, like observational. Yeah. I think what he does is so clever. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm always sort of awed by observational comics because when they say it, you're like, oh, yeah, I see that, but I don't think like that. I'm like, I wish I had that kind of brain, you know, that, that could look at something so mundane and put that funny twist on it. I think that's genius, mm-hmm. you know. <clears throat> but um, I definitely am more of the storyteller. De- definitely self-deprecating, make fun of myself all the time. Thank God I have kids to make fun of Um that gives me a lot of material. Yeah. Oh. But, yeah, so that's, that's what I've been doing. So, uh, you know, had this childhood career, took a long break, and was an educator. I taught English for many years in um, a very um, highly diverse, socioeconomically depressed um, area of the island. A lot of people coming from other countries, and I've been in that district for 28 years, and I was an English teacher, and then, and now I'm an administrator, so I've had really already had two careers in my life, Mm -hmm. Um, one as a child, one as an adult, and now I'm looking toward retirement and going into that third career and entertainment again, so hopefully it'll work out. Wow, that's wonderful that you're getting a head start, though, on the comedy before you retire and stuff. Oh, yeah, because it's something that I can do on my free time. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it. It's a common bond for me and my daughter, so we do it together, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. And she, <clears throat> she's hilarious. She just, she's got that, that um, Kristen Wiig kind of timing. You know, she's got that Tina Fey sort of delivery. She's just very... Um, very dry, mm-hmm. and she hits the mark every time. And her delivery is just hysterical. Very funny delivery. Very straight. Mm-hmm. Do you have- so it's the pleasure just doing it with her, and then we, you know, we bounce things off of one another, and we ask each other's opinions. So that's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Do, do you ever see uh, Judy Oliver around? I'm sorry, who? Judy Oliver. No. She's a comedian in New York. She's very funny. Oh, really? Yeah. She she was an actor. Uh, she was an actress for many years and stuff, and then she got into stand-up about 15 years ago or something like that, or, tw- or, or 20, something like that, and she's very funny, and we we always send each other dirty jokes late at night. <laughs> <laughs> Judy or Jody? Jody. Jody Oliver. Oh, okay. I'll have to look her up. I'll have to see. Do you, you ever see Louis C.K. around town? Uh, no, I have not seen him around town. But um, 
you know, I'm always hoping that I'm doing a show somewhere and there's going to be that moment, you know, where that comedian's in the audience and they go, hey, she was pretty funny. Mm-hmm. You know? And I, I think I'd like to work with her. That, of course, that's the dream. Yeah. You know? That was my but, dream, too. I just... I took it for granted, like, you know, I was, I was always expecting to, you know, just, you know, put myself out there and get discovered without, you know, putting much effort into the self-promotion uh, part of it, uh, you know, in the beginning, before social media became what it is now, you know, and right. I've learned, you know, I've, I've learned how to do it otherwise, but at that time, that was, that was my thing, you know, just go and get discovered because nobody was, you know, mentoring me. Yeah, you have to, uh, you know, but it is a learning process, and as long as you learn from it, then then that's the good thing. Mm-hmm. You and have to learn from it. You have to be open. You have to be a lifelong learner. The minute you think you know everything, you're done. Yeah. You know? I've been in education for 28 years. I don't know everything. I know a lot. I don't know everything. And I'm always learning. And it's the same thing with, with comedy. I mean, I know nothing about comedy. So I'm really learning and starting from, you know, the ground floor up. And even even as far as, you know, acting and singing and stuff like that, that whole um, part of it has changed so much since when I was a kid. Yeah. I, mean, I, did, I did eight shows a week yeah. for a year and a half. These days, you have kids on Broadway. Yeah. They have kids, multiple kids for the same role. You never see a kid doing eight shows a week. You know, they have like child labor laws now. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, but I know me too, um, that would aggravate me to no end. That would aggravate me. Like, no, that's my part. I want to do that part every night, every night, every day. That's, I want to do it. It would really bother me to have to share it. I remember when I was touring, um, I got the chicken pox. Oh. And I got a very mild taste. So I only missed one show. So I was like, all right, one show. But then we were traveling, and I got the flu. And I got the flu on stage. Yeah. Where I opened my mouth to sing, and nothing came out. And so now I'm sitting there in the opening scenes trying to sing maybe, and it's awful. Nothing's coming out, and I'm starting to cry. And you can see in the first couple of rows of the audience, like, they know that's not how I really sing, and they were feeling really bad for me. Mm -hmm. And in the play, Annie gets carried off the stage in a laundry basket, and they carried me off. And the next scene, my understudy got carried on. Um, and I had to miss a week's worth of shows, and I was livid. I was livid. I was so mad. I wanted, I, there's nothing I could do. But, you know, I have that work ethic, you know? Right. So I actually had to miss a week of work for my surgery that I just had. It drove me nuts. Mm-hmm. I I'm can not, imagine. I'm not that person, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to take a sick day when I'm sick. And so, and I try not to be sick. <laughs> take any sick days. <laughs> I was, so that's, just, that's who I am. That's just the way I'm wired. Yeah. I was listening to the interview you did with uh, Greg a couple of years ago, and on there you... Oh, yeah. Yeah, he and I, we steal each other's guests all the time. <laughs> we, we help each other uh, get each other's guests all the time, too. Um, but I was listening to the interview you, you two did a couple years ago, and um, you mentioned on there that um, there was a period where uh, you were battling lupus. Yes, yeah, still battling it. Still? Mm-hmm. Is it, is, it, so is it under control, at least? It is. It's under control. It is that in 19 years uh, since I was diagnosed, mm-hmm. and I do take medication, and I probably um, don't take care of myself as well as I 
should. Um, but I try to take good care of myself and try to remember to take my medicine every day. But it is under control, and I'm very lucky. I have a, a, a mild case. I know that there are people with lupus who are really, really suffering. So um, I try to keep that in the back of my mind when I, I tend to do things that are not good for me, whether, you know, push myself and and forget to take my medicine, which I'm, I'm horrible at remembering that stuff. So I try to remember, hey, there are people who have this a lot worse than you, so, you know, get your act together and take your meds. But um, overall, knock on wood, I'm in pretty good health, and it's under control. So thank goodness for that. You, you'll have one of those, uh, what, what do you call those, um, those, uh, they're like those little uh, plastic uh, uh, pill calendars. <laughs> yes, I do. I do have one of those. You'd think that would help me. I'm still forgetful, <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to be on top of it more and be a little bit more. 2020 is my year that I'm going to remember to take my medicine every day. <laughs> that's my New Year's resolution. Yeah, that's good. That's good. My New Year's resolution is to lose a ton of weight. Um, uh, I've been depressed, you know, recovering from my accident, you know, they told me that was going to happen and, uh, I, my blood sugar is pretty high. It's not quite near diabetes, but it's pretty close. And so I got to fix it this year. Uh, it runs, in, it runs on my mom's side of the family and I don't want to go anywhere near it. No, no, not at all. That's, that's really dangerous. And, uh, you know, you should follow, um, this comedian, out here is named Anthony D. Domenico. Mm-hmm. And he's been, in addition to doing comedy, he, he's been on Weight Watchers. Um, very, very inspiring to look at where he was mm-hmm. and see where he is now. And, um, you know, he has a, a, a podcast or a, not a podcast, a webcast that he does. Yeah, web so, series. Yeah, so, you know, it, Look him up on Facebook and check him out because I think you would, um, you know, if, if that's your your resolution, you, you might, I don't know, you might get some sort of a, a closure whatever from a push, maybe, yes. Kind of like, it's kind of like, wow, if you can do it, man, then, then I should be able to do it too because he, he started out, I don't know what he weighed, but he was very, very, um, very big boy. Mm-hmm. So he really worked hard and, and I, I can only imagine that that's very difficult. Um, you know, I know just losing weight in general mm-hmm. is difficult. And being 4'11 and 3 quarters, which I am, um, you put on 5 pounds on a 4'11 frame, and that looks like 15 pounds. So mm-hmm. I have to be very aware of, you know, gaining weight and stuff because it looks like a lot of weight on me. And so... Um, so I know it's difficult to lose weight when you just want to lose a few pounds. If you have, if you have a lot of weight you want to lose, it, it, I'm, I'm sure it can be very daunting. Mm-hmm. Do you, uh, Anthony, yeah. Anthony Domenico, you said? D, D. Domenico. D. Domenico. Okay, I'll check him out. Check him out, definitely. And for your health, do it. Because, you know, like you said, you don't want to get anywhere near that diabetes. No, no. Yo. It's been It's been a lifelong fear of mine. And I've been big my whole life. Um, I lost 130 pounds back in 2006. Um, I had a nutritionist and all that stuff. And it was a lot easier then because I was 23. Now I'm 36. It's just really tough, you know. It is, but, you know, you do it now because it's always going to be tough. Yeah. It's always going to be tough. You know, women, after they have babies, you know, their bodies never, ever ever go back to the way they were. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's a struggle. It's a struggle all the time from from somebody who has to lose five pounds to somebody who has to lose 105 pounds. It's a struggle. And it's, it's everybody is their own worst critic. Yeah. And when you look in the mirror and you look at yourself and, you know, now I'm, I'm 50-ish. I'm in my 50s, early 50s. And I look in the mirror and I go, who is that? You know? <laughs> what what happened? Who is that person looking at me? Yeah. Is that my grandmother? <laughs> and, not, and not the good years. Not the good years. So, you know, it, 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 it's a struggle for 
every, for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but I would kill to be 36 again. Oh, not in not in this era. You wouldn't. <laughs> it's just no. a lot harder now. <laughs> I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. But I think, you know, we're, we're going to say, when you're my age, you're going to look at a 36-year-old and go, I wouldn't want to be 36 now. It was easier when I was 36. I think, you know, we all get kind of bogged down in our stuff. But yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Definitely so, do. So, Roseanne, there's this game that I like to play with my guests. Um, okay. It's silly slumber party questions, and how this works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, and I answer it. Okay. Roseanne, are you ticklish? Yes, I am. Are you ticklish? I am baby ticklish, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm ticklish, moderately ticklish, but I'm ticklish. Mm-hmm. Um, is your belly button an innie or an outie? It is an innie. What is your belly button, an innie or an outie? It's an innie. An innie, right. Yeah. Go innie. Yeah. <laughs> what color are your toenails? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, what, no, go ahead. What color are your toenails painted? Oh, my gosh. Actually, my toenails are painted, it's called Slim Theory. It's like a, a brownish terracotta type of color. What color are your toenails painted? They're not painted right now, but last time they were, they were purples with sparkles. Ooh, very nice. Good choice. <laughs> yeah, I like to go with the uh, elaborate colors. Oh, go big or go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then my favorite question is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Oh, wow. Um, a stinky smell that just makes you gag. Yes. I guess I would have to say vomit, I guess, is a stinky smell that would make me gag. That's a popular one. Know, you know, once, once you're a mom, you, you, you can handle a lot of stinky smells. Once you're, a, once you're a parent, because I've heard in Alaska at high speed, so you, you kind of get uh, numb to them. But um, I've heard. <laughs> yeah. So, what about you? Is there a stinky smell that makes you gag? Uh, either farts or feet. Okay. Yeah. Well, those, those are equally as bad, definitely. I have, I have but, this, I have this one friend. Um, she can she can tolerate the smell of of her baby son's um, of doo doo when you know. <laughs> just to change diapers. <laughs> yeah. I was yep. like, I was like, I don't know how you can do that. I really don't. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, you, you can do it. And then if, if for some reason your own kid's poop makes you bad, then that's the bad poop. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've changed a lot of poopy diapers in my life, and there were one or two that made you gag. That was bad. That was a bad poop. So. Oh. Yeah, that's that's. I like cool. that. I like that we ended talking about poop. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you really quickly. Uh, wh- what's your favorite joke of all time? Uh, of of my own joke. It, it could be yours. It could be somebody else's. It could be public domain. Anything. Oh uh, well, okay. I'll, I'm going to tell you my favorite joke. That's mine, mm-hmm. and then um, my favorite joke from you know Whitney Cummings. Oh yes. Okay, so I love I love her whole everything, her whole deal, everything, and she does a joke. She's talking about you know how guys will cat call women on the street, mm-hmm. and she says, "What if girls were cat calling men?" And she says, "And there's a guy he drives by in his sports car, and girls would say, i 'I'm sorry about your dick.' I thought I wish that was my <laughs> joke." I wish that was my joke so bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just think that's freaking hilarious. So Whitney Cummings, if you're listening, I love you. I have a girl crush on you. I- um, <laughs> and uh, my favorite joke um, for me is probably one of the first jokes that I ever wrote. And it's how um, when I open my, my act, one of the first lines I say is I tell the crowd that, you know, I am divorced. I 
was hoping for Widow. But once again, he can't make me happy. <laughs> That's pretty good. So that was that was my first joke, and it always gets a laugh, which I love, because that means there are other women out there who think just like me. So. <laughs> okay, for me, um, um, okay, th- this is this is not very family friendly, but uh, <laughs> Nick, Nikki Glaser. Um, oh, I love her too. Yes. Um, on her her first Netflix special, she did. I haven't seen the new one yet. I've been lagging, but on the old one, she said um, she loves getting finger banged in public. She says it's <laughs> it's like the uh, travel version of Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she's good. She's very crass. I love that about her. And then my favorite uh, p- my favorite public domain joke, and you're probably going to send me to the principal's office after this. <laughs> Um, how do you make your wife scream twice? I don't know. How do you? First, you fuck her up the ass, and then you wipe your dick on the curtain. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's fresh. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I hope your mother's not listening. Oh, she's heard me say much worse. My mother's not easily offended at all. Oh, well, that's good. Neither is mine. Mom, I love that I have a cool mom. Well, my mother, like yours, is Italian. Okay, so there it is. Yes. Now, now, if you check out my Facebook Live, or you can look me up on YouTube, look up Brace Yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Brace Yourself. I have my mother mother on twice, and she's hilarious. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, brace yourself. I'll I'll take a look at that. Do you, uh, do you have any upcoming shows you want to plug? Uh, I would love to. I will be at uh, the Greenwich Village Comedy Club on January 11th, um, six o'clock show, and um, I will also be at Governor's Little Room on uh, January 26th. So if you're in the area and you're listening to this podcast and you want to come see me do some comedy and you want me to make you laugh, then please try to come and see me at one of those shows. Some, someday I'll make it to New York. That's like my dream to go to New York. Awesome. Well, you definitely should come out here, come to New York and do some comedy. I'll try. I heard it's, re- I heard it's really tough. They're, they, they, take, they take comedy very seriously out there. Well, yeah, definitely do. But like, I'm I'm doing clubs in the city, and I'm doing stuff out here. So there's definitely a place for new comedians to kind of um, get their toe in the water and and learn how to swim. Mm-hmm. Well, Roseanne, you are an amazing inspiration, and I can't tell you how honored I was to talk to you today. Well, thank you very much, and I was honored as well that you wanted to talk to me. So. It's always nice to know that people still want to talk to you because when they want to stop talking to you, that's that's a bad sign. (laughs) So thank you very, very much for this opportunity. I really do appreciate it. My pleasure. And happy early birthday. Oh, thank you very much. God bless you and have a great day. And please take care of yourself because we need you. Thank you. And we need you as well. So... Good luck to you and everything, and I look forward to our paths crossing again. Absolutely. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Roseanne Sorrentino. Ain't she a sweetheart? She's just an amazing inspiration of a lady. I'm glad I got to talk to her. I'm just so friggin' lucky of... Of how of, I'm just so freaking lucky of just how I'm able to communicate with these wonderful, sweet people that I do. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. It's a hard knock life.